Chapter fifty eight of the small house at Allington by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty eight The Fate of the Small House. There was something in the tone of Mrs. Dale's voice as she desired her daughter to come up to the house and declared that her budget of news should be opened there which at once silenced Liddy's assumed pleasantry her mother had been away fully two hours during which Lily had still continued her walk round the garden till at last she had become impatient for her mother's footstep something serious must have been said between her uncle and her mother during those long two hours the interviews to which mrs dale was occasionally summoned at the great house did not usually exceed twenty minutes and the upshot would be communicated to the girls in a turn or two round the garden but in the present instance mrs dale positively declined to speak till she was seated within the house did he come over on purpose to see you mamma yes my dear i believe so he wished to see you too but i asked his permission to postpone that till after i had talked to you to see me mamma about what to kiss you and bid you love him solely for that he has not a word to say to you that will vex you then i will kiss him and love him too yes you will when i have told you all i have promised him solemnly to give up all idea of going to guestwick so that is over oh oh and we may begin to unpack at once what an episode in one's life we may certainly unpack for i have pledged myself to him and he is to go into guestwick himself and arrange about the lodgings does hopkins know it i should think not yet nor mrs boyce mamma i don't believe i shall be able to survive this next week we shall look such fools i'll tell you what we'll do it will be the only comfort i can have we'll go to work and get everything back into its place before bell comes home so as to surprise her what in two days why not i'll make hopkins come and help and then he'll not be so bad i'll begin at once and go to the blankets and beds because i can undo them myself but i haven't half told you all and indeed i don't know how to make you understand what passed between us he is very unhappy about bernard bernard has determined to go abroad and may be away for years one can hardly blame a man for following up his profession there was no blaming he only said that it was very sad for him that in his old age he should be left alone this was before there was any talk about our remaining indeed he seemed determined not to ask that again as a favour i could see that in his eye and i understood it from his tone he went on to speak of you and bell saying how well he loved you both but that unfortunately his hopes regarding you had not been fulfilled ah but he shouldn't have had hopes of that sort listen my dear and i think that you will not feel angry with him he said that he felt his house had never been pleasant to you then there followed words which i could not repeat even if i could remember them he said much about myself regretting that the feeling between us had not been more kindly but my heart he said has ever been kinder than my words then i got up from where i was seated and going over to him i told him that we would remain here and what did he say i don't know what he said i know that i was crying and that he kissed me it was the first time in his life i know that he was pleased beyond measure pleased after a while he became animated and talked of doing ever so many things he promised that very painting of which you spoke oh yes i knew it and hopkins will be here with the peas before dinner-time to-morrow and dingles with his shoulders smothered with rabbits and then mrs boyce mamma he didn't think of mrs boyce or in very charity of heart he would still have maintained his sadness 
then he did not think of her for when i left him he was not at all sad but i haven't told you half yet dear me mamma was there more than that and i've told it all wrong for what i've got to tell now was said before a word was spoken about the house he brought it in just after what he said about bernard he said that bernard would of course be his heir of course he will and that he should think it wrong to encumber the property with any charges for you girls mamma did any one ever stop lily stop and make your heart kinder towards him if you can it is kind only i hate to be told that i am not to have a lot of money as though i had ever shown a desire for it i have never envied bernard his man-servant or his maid-servant or his ox or his ass or anything that is his to tell the truth i didn't even wish it to be bells because i knew well that there was somebody she would like a great deal better than ever she could like bernard i shall never get to the end of my story yes you will mamma if you persevere the long and the short of it is this that he has given bell three thousand pounds and has given you three thousand also but why me mamma said lily and the colour of her cheeks became red as she spoke there should if possible be nothing more said about john eames but whatever might or might not be the necessity of speaking at any rate let there be no mistake but why me mamma because as he explained to me he thinks it right to do the same by each of you the money is yours at this moment to buy hairpins with if you please i had no idea that he could command so large a sum three thousand pounds the last money he gave me was half a crown and i thought that he was so stingy i particularly wanted ten shillings i should have liked it so much better now if he had given me a nice new five-pound note you'd better tell him so no because then he'd give me that too but with five pounds i should have the feeling that i might do what i liked with it buy a dressing-case and a thing for a squirrel to run round in but nobody ever gives girls money like that so that they can enjoy it oh lily you ungrateful child no i deny it i'm not ungrateful i'm very grateful because his heart was softened and because he cried and kissed you i'll be ever so good to him but how i'm to thank him for giving me three thousand pounds i cannot think it's a sort of thing altogether beyond my line of life it sounds like something that's to come to me in another world but which i don't want quite yet i am grateful but with a misty mazy sort of gratitude can you tell me how soon i shall have a new pair of balmoral boots because of this money if that were brought home to me i think it would enliven my gratitude the squire as he rode back to guestwick fell again from that animation which mrs dale had described into his natural sombre mood he thought much of his past life declaring to himself the truth of those words in which he had told his sister-in-law that his heart had ever been kinder than his words but the world and all those nearest to him in the world had judged him always by his words rather than by his heart they had taken the appearance which he could not command or alter rather than the facts of which he had been the master had he not been good to all his relations and yet was there one among them that cared for him i am almost sorry that they are going to stay he said to himself i know that i shall disappoint them yet when he met bell at the manor-house he accosted her cheerily telling her with much appearance of satisfaction that that flitting into guestwick was not to be accomplished i am so glad said she it is long since i wished it and i do not think your mother wishes it now i am sure she does not it was all a misunderstanding from the first when some of us could not do all that you wished we thought it better then bell paused finding that she would get herself into a mess if she persevered we will not say any more about it 
said the squire. The thing is over, and I am very glad that it should be so pleasantly settled. I was talking to Dr. Crofts yesterday. Were you, uncle? Yes, and he is to come and stay with me the day before he is married. We have arranged it all, and we'll have the breakfast up at the great house. Only you must fix the day. I should say some time in May. And, my dear, you'll want to make yourself fine. Here's a little money for you. You are to spend that before your marriage, you know. Then he shambled away, and as soon as he was alone, again became sad and despondent. He was a man for whom we may predicate some gentle sadness and continued despondency to the end of his life's chapter. We left John Eames in the custody of Lady Julia, who had overtaken him in the act of erasing Lily's name from the railing which ran across the brook. He had been premeditating an escape home to his mother's house in Guestwick, and thence back to London, without making any further appearance at the manor-house. But as soon as he heard Lady Julia's step, and saw her figure close upon him, he knew that his retreat was cut off from him. So he allowed himself to be led away quietly up to the house. With Lady Julia herself he openly discussed the whole matter, telling her that his hopes were over, his happiness gone, and his heart half-broken, though he would perhaps have cared but little for her congratulations in success. He could make himself more amenable to consolation and sympathy from her than from any other inmate in the earl's house. "'I don't know what I shall say to your brother,' he whispered to her as they approached the side door at which she intended to enter. "'Will you let me break it to him? After that he will say a few words to you, of course, but you need not be afraid of him.' "'And Mr. Dale,' said Johnny, "'everybody has heard about it.' everybody will know what a fool i have made myself she suggested that the earl should speak to the squire assured him that nobody would think him at all foolish and then left him to make his way up to his own bedroom when there he found a letter from crudel which had been delivered in his absence but the contents of that letter may best be deferred to the next chapter they were not of a nature to give him comfort or to add to his sorrow about an hour before dinner there was a knock at his door, and the earl himself, when summoned, made his appearance in the room. He was dressed in his usual farming attire, having been caught by Lady Julia on his first approach to the house, and had come away direct to his young friend, after having been duly trained in what he ought to say by his kind-hearted sister. I am not, however, prepared to declare that he strictly followed his sister's teaching, in all that he said upon the occasion well my boy he began so the young lady has been perverse yes my lord that is i don't know about being perverse it is all over that's as may be johnny as far as i know not half of them accept their lovers the first time of asking i shall not ask her again oh yes you will you don't mean to say you are angry with her for refusing you not in the least i have no right to be angry i am only angry with myself for being such a fool lord de guest i wish i had been dead before i came down here on this errand now i think of it i know there are so many things which ought to have made me sure how it would be i don't see that at all you come down again let me see it's may now say you come when the shooting begins in september if we can't get you leave of absence in any other way we'll make old buffle come too only by george i believe he'd shoot us all but never mind we'll manage that you keep up your spirits till september and then we'll fight the battle in another way the squire shall get up a little party for the bride and my lady lily must go then you shall meet her so and then we'll shoot over the squire's land we'll bring you together so you see if we don't lord bless me refused once 
my belief is that in these days a girl thinks nothing of a man till she has refused him half a dozen times i don't think lily is at all like that look here johnny i have not a word to say against miss lily i like her very much and think her one of the nicest girls i know when she's your wife i'll love her dearly if she'll let me but she's made of the same stuff as other girls and will act in the same way things have gone a little astray among you and they won't right themselves all in a minute she knows now what your feelings are and she'll go on thinking of it till at last you'll be in her thoughts more than that other fellow don't tell me about her becoming an old maid because at her time of life she has been so unfortunate as to come across a false-hearted man like that it may take a little time but if you'll carry on and not be downhearted you'll find it will all come right in the end everybody doesn't get all that they want in a minute how i shall quiz you about all this when you have been two or three years married i don't think i shall ever be able to ask her again and i feel sure if i do that her answer will be the same she told me in so many words but never mind i cannot repeat her words i don't want you to repeat them nor yet to heed them beyond their worth lily dale is a very pretty girl clever too i believe and good i'm sure but her words are not more sacred than those of other men or women what she has said to you now she means no doubt but the minds of men and women are prone to change especially when such changes are conducive to their own happiness at any rate i'll never forget your kindness lord de guest and there is one other thing i want to say to you johnny a man should never allow himself to be cast down by anything not outwardly to the eyes of other men but how is he to help it his pluck should prevent him you were not afraid of a roaring bull nor yet of that man when you thrashed him at the railway station you've pluck enough of that kind you must now show that you've that other kind of pluck you know the story of the boy who would not cry though the wolf was gnawing him underneath his frock most of us have some wolf to gnaw us somewhere but we are generally gnawed beneath our clothes so that the world doesn't see and it behoves us so to bear it that the world shall not suspect the man who goes about declaring himself to be miserable will be not only miserable but contemptible as well but the wolf hasn't gnawed me beneath my clothes everybody knows it then let those who do know it learn that you are able to bear such wounds without outward complaint i tell you fairly that i cannot sympathize with a lackadaisical lover i know that i have made myself ridiculous to everybody i wish i had never come here i wish you had never seen me don't say that my dear boy but take my advice for what it is worth and remember what it is that i say with your grief i do sympathize but not with any outward expression of it not with melancholy looks and a sad voice and an unhappy gait a man should always be able to drink his wine and seem to enjoy it if he can't he is so much less of a man than he would be otherwise not so much more as some people seem to think now get yourself dressed my dear fellow and come down to dinner as though nothing had happened to you as soon as the earl was gone john looked at his watch and saw that it still wanted some forty minutes to dinner fifteen minutes would suffice for him to dress and therefore there was time sufficient for him to seat himself in his armchair and think over it all he had for a moment been very angry when his friend had told him that he could not sympathize with a lackadaisical lover it was an ill-natured word he felt it to be so when he heard it and so he continued to think during the whole of the half-hour that he sat in that chair but it probably did him more good than any word that the earl had ever spoken to him or any other word that he could have used lackadaisical 
I'm not lackadaisical, he said to himself, jumping up from his chair and instantly sitting down again. I didn't say anything to him. I didn't tell him. Why did he come to me? And yet, though he endeavoured to abuse Lord de Guest in his thoughts, he knew that Lord de Guest was right, and that he was wrong. He knew that he had been lackadaisical, and was ashamed of himself, and at once resolved that he would henceforth demean himself as though no calamity had happened to him. I've a good mind to take him at his word and drink wine till I'm drunk. Then he strove to get up his courage by a song. If she be not fair for me, what care I how? But I do care. What stuff it is, a man writing poetry and putting into it such lies as that. Everybody knows that he did care, that is, if he wasn't a heartless beast. But nevertheless, when the time came for him to go down into the drawing-room, he did make the effort which his friend had counselled, and walked into the room with less of that hang-dog look than the Earl and Lady Julia had expected. They were both there, as was also the squire, and Bell followed him in less than a minute. "'You haven't seen Crofts to-day, John, have you?' said the Earl. "'No, I haven't been anywhere his way.' "'His way? His ways are every way, I take it. I wanted him to come and dine, but he seemed to think it improper to eat two dinners in the same house two days running. Isn't that his theory, Miss Dale?' "'I'm sure I don't know, Lord de Guest. At any rate, it isn't mine.' So they went to their feast, and before his last chance was over, John Eames found himself able to go through the pretence of enjoying his roast mutton. There can, I think, be no doubt that in all such calamities as that which he was now suffering, the agony of the misfortune is much increased by the conviction that the facts of the case are known to those round about the sufferer. A most warm-hearted and intensely feeling young gentleman might no doubt eat an excellent dinner after being refused by the girl of his devotions, provided that he had reason to believe that none of those in whose company he ate it knew anything of his rejection. But the same warm-hearted and intensely feeling young gentleman would find it very difficult to go through the ceremony with any appearance of true appetite or gastronomic enjoyment if he were aware that all his convives knew all the facts of his little misfortune. Generally, we may suppose, a man in such condition goes to his club for his dinner, or seeks consolation in the shades of some adjacent Richmond or Hampton Court. There he meditates on his condition in silence, and does ultimately enjoy his little plate of white bait, his cutlet, and his moderate pint of sherry. He probably goes alone to the theatre, and in his stall speculates with a somewhat bitter sarcasm on the vanity of the world. Then he returns home, sad indeed, but with a moderated sadness, and as he puffs out the smoke of his cigar at the open window, with perhaps the comfort of a little brandy and water at his elbow, swears to himself that, by Jove, he'll have another try for it. Alone a man may console himself, or among a crowd of unconscious mortals. But it must be admitted that the position of John Eames was severe. He had been invited down there to woo Lily Dale, and the squire and Bell had been asked to be present at the wooing. Had it all gone well, nothing could have been nicer. He would have been the hero of the hour, and everybody would have sung for him his song of triumph. But everything had not gone well, and he found it very difficult to carry himself otherwise than lackadaisically. On the whole, however, his effort was such that the Earl gave him credit for his demeanour, and told him, when parting with him for the night, that he was a fine fellow, and that everything should go right with him yet. "'And you mustn't be angry with me for speaking harshly to you,' he said. "'I wasn't a bit angry.' "'Yes, you were, and I rather meant that you should be. But you mustn't go away in dudgeon.' He stayed at the manor-house one day longer, and then he returned to his room at the income-tax office, 
to the disagreeable sound of sir raffle's little bell and the much more disagreeable sound of sir raffle's big voice end of chapter fifty eight read by nick whitley purley united kingdom eighth of december two thousand and twenty three Chapter fifty nine of the Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty nine John Eames becomes a man. Eames, when he was half way up to London in the railway carriage, took out from his pocket a letter and read it. During the former portion of his journey, he had been thinking of other things but gradually he had resolved that it would be better for him not to think more of those other things for the present and therefore he had recourse to his letter by way of dissipating his thoughts it was from crudel and ran as follows income tax office may dash eighteen sixty dash my dear john i hope the tidings which i have to give you will not make you angry and that you will not think i am untrue to the great friendship which i have for you because of that which i am now going to tell you there is no man and the word man was underscored there is no man whose regard i value so highly as i do yours and though i feel that you can have no just ground to be displeased with me after all that i have heard you say on many occasions nevertheless in matters of the heart it is very hard for one person to understand the sentiments of another and when the affections of a lady are concerned i know that quarrels will sometimes arise eames when he had got so far as this on the first perusal of the letter knew well what was to follow poor caudle he said to himself he's hooked and he'll never get himself off the hook again but let that be as it may the matter has now gone too far for any alteration to be made by me nor would any mere earthly inducement suffice to change me the claims of friendship are very strong but those of love are paramount of course i know all that has passed between you and amelia roper much of this i had heard from you before but the rest she has now told me with that pure-minded honesty which is the most remarkable feature in her character she has confessed that at one time she felt attached to you and that she was induced by your perseverance to allow you to regard her as your fiancée fancy girl he probably conceived to be the vulgar english for the elegant term which he used but all that must be over between you now amelia has promised to be mine this also was underscored and mine i intend that she shall be that you may find in the kind smiles of l d consolation for any disappointment which this may occasion you is the ardent wish of your true friend joseph crudel p s perhaps i had better tell you the whole mrs roper has been in some trouble about her house she is a little in arrears with her rent and some bills have not been paid as she explained that she has been brought into this by those dreadful lupexes i have consented to take the house into my own hands and have given bills to one or two tradesmen for small amounts of course she will take them up but it was the credit that was wanting she will carry on the house but i shall in fact be the proprietor i suppose it will not suit you now to remain here but don't you think i might make it comfortable enough for some of our fellows say half a dozen or so that is mrs roper's idea and i certainly think it is not a bad one our first efforts must be to get rid of the lupexes 
Miss Spruce goes next week. In the meantime, we are all taking our meals up in our own rooms, so that there is nothing for the Lupexes to eat. But they don't seem to mind that, and still keep the sitting-room and best bedroom. We mean to lock them out after Tuesday, and send all their boxes to the public house. Poor Crudell! Eames, as he threw himself back upon his seat, and contemplated the depths of misfortune into which his friend had fallen, began to be almost in love with his own position. He himself was, no doubt, a very miserable fellow. There was only one thing in life worth living for, and that he could not get. He had been thinking for the last three days of throwing himself before a locomotive steam engine, and was not quite sure that he would not do it yet. But nevertheless his place was a place among the gods as compared to that which poor Crudell had selected for himself. To be not only the husband of Amelia Roper, but to have been driven to take upon himself as his bride's fortune the whole of his future mother-in-law's debts, to find himself the owner of a very indifferent lodging-house, the owner as regarded all responsibility, though not the owner as regarded any possible profit, and then, above and almost worse than all the rest, to find himself saddled with the Lupexes in the beginning of his career. Poor Crudell, indeed! Eames had not taken his things away from the lodging-house before he left London, and therefore determined to drive to Burton Crescent immediately on his arrival, not with the intention of remaining there even for a night, but that he might bid them farewell, speak his congratulations to Amelia, and arrange for his final settlement with Mrs. Roper. It should have been explained in the last chapter that the Earl had told him before parting with him that his want of success with Lily would make no difference as regarded money. John had, of course, expostulated, saying that he did not want anything, and would not under his existing circumstances accept anything. But the Earl was a man who knew how to have his own way, and in this matter did have it. Our friend, therefore, was a man of wealth when he returned to London, and could tell Mrs. Roper that he would send her a cheque for her little balance as soon as he reached his office. He arrived in the middle of the day, not timing his return at all after the usual manner of government clerks, who generally manage to reach the metropolis not more than half an hour before the moment at which they are bound to show themselves in their seats. But he had come back two days before he was due, and had run away from the country as though London in May to him were much pleasanter than the woods and fields. But neither had London nor the woods and fields any influence on his return. He had gone down that he might throw himself at the feet of Lily Dale, gone down, as he now confessed to himself, with hopes almost triumphant, and he had returned because Lily Dale would not have him at her feet. I loved him, him, Crosby, better than all the world besides. It is still the same. I still love him better than all the world. Those were the words which had driven him back to London and having been sent away with such words as those, it was little matter to him whether he reached his office a day or two sooner or later. The little room in the city, even with the accompaniment of Sir Raffle's bell and Sir Raffle's voice, would be now more congenial to him than Lady Julia's drawing-room. He would therefore present himself to Sir Raffle on that very afternoon, and expel some interloper from his seat but he would first call in Burton Crescent and say farewell to the Ropers. The door was opened for him by the faithful Jemima. Mr. Hames! Mr. Hames! Oh, dear! Oh, dear! And the poor girl, who had always taken his side in the adventures of the lodging-house, raised her hands on high and lamented the fate which had separated her favourite from its fortunes. "'I suppose you knows it all, Mr. Johnny?' Mr. Johnny said that he believed he did know it all, and asked for the mistress of the house. "'Yes, sure enough, she's at home. She don't dare stir out much, cause of them Lupexes. Ain't this a pretty game? No dinner and no nothing. 
them boxes is miss spruce's she's a-going now this minute you'll find em all upstairs in the drawing-room so upstairs into the drawing-room he went and there he found the mother and daughter and with them miss spruce tightly packed up in her bonnet and shawl don't mother amelia was saying what's the good of going on in that way if she chooses to go let her go and she's been with me now so many years said mrs roper sobbing and i've always done everything for her haven't i now sally spruce it struck eames immediately that though he had been an inmate in the house for two years he had never before heard that maiden lady's christian name miss spruce was the first to see eames as he entered the room it is probable that mrs roper's pathos might have produced some answering pathos on her part had she remained unobserved but the sight of a young man brought her back to her usual state of quiescence i'm only an old woman said she and here's mr eames come back again how do you do mrs roper how do you do amelia how do you do miss bruce and he shook hands with them all oh laws said mrs roper you have given me such a start dear me mr eames only think of your coming back in that way said amelia well what way should i come back you didn't hear me knock at the door that's all so miss spruce is really going to leave you isn't it dreadful mr eames nineteen years we've been together taking both houses together miss spruce we have indeed miss spruce at this point struggled very hard to convince john eames that the period in question had in truth extended over only eighteen years but mrs roper was authoritative and would not permit it it's nineteen years if it's a day no one ought to know dates if i don't and there isn't one in the world understands her ways unless it's me haven't i been up to your bedroom every night and with my own hand given you but she stopped herself and was too good a woman to declare before a young man what had been the nature of her nightly ministrations to her guest i don't think you'll be so comfortable anywhere else miss spruce said eames comfortable of course she won't said amelia but if i was mother i wouldn't have any more words about it it isn't the money i'm thinking of but the feeling of it said mrs roper the house will be so lonely like i shan't know myself that i shan't and now that things are all settled so pleasantly and that the lupexes must go on tuesday i'll tell you what sally i'll pay for the cab myself and i'll start off to dulwich by the omnibus to-morrow and settle it all out of my own pocket i will indeed come there's the cab let me go down and send him away i'll do that said eames it's only sixpence off the stand mrs roper called to him as he left the room but the cabman got a shilling and john as he returned found jemima in the act of carrying miss spruce's boxes back to her room so much the better for poor caudle said he to himself as he has gone into the trade it's well that he should have somebody that will pay him mrs roper followed miss spruce up the stairs and johnny was left with amelia he's written to you i know said she with her face turned a little away from him she was certainly very handsome but there was a hard cross almost sullen look about her which robbed her countenance of all its pleasantness and yet she had no intention of being sullen with him yes said john he has told me how it's all going to be well she said well said he is that all you've got to say i'll congratulate you if you'll let me Cha! congratulations i hate such humbug if you've no feelings about it i'm sure that i've none indeed i don't know what's the good of feelings they never did me any good are you engaged to marry l d no i am not and you've nothing else to say to me nothing except my hopes for your happiness what else can i say you are engaged to marry my friend crudel and i think it will be a happy match she turned away her face further from him and the look of it became even more sullen could it be possible that at such a moment she still had a hope that he might come back to her 
Goodbye, Amelia, he said, putting out his hand to her. And this is to be the last of you in this house. Well, I don't know about that. I'll come and call upon you, if you'll let me, when you're married. Yes, she said, that there may be rows in the house and noise and jealousy, as there have been with that wicked woman upstairs. Not if I know it, you won't, John Eames. I wish I'd never seen you. I wish we might have both fallen dead when we first met. I didn't think ever to have cared for a man as I have cared for you. It's all trash and nonsense and foolery. I know that. It's all very well for young ladies as can sit in drawing-rooms all their lives, but when a woman has a way to make in the world, it's all foolery, and such a hard way to make as mine is. But it won't be hard now, won't it? But I think it will. I wish you would try it. Not that I'm going to complain. I never minded work, and as for company, I can put up with anybody. The world's not to be all dancing and fiddling for the likes of me. I know that well enough, but... And then she paused. What's the but about, Amelia? It's like you to ask me, isn't it? To tell the truth, he should not have asked her. Never mind, I'm not going to have any words with you. If you've been a knave, I've been a fool, and that's worse. But I don't think I have been a knave. I've been both, said the girl, and both for nothing. After that you may go. I've told you what I am, and I'll leave you to name yourself. I didn't think it was in me to have been such a fool. It's that that frets me. Never mind, sir. It's all over now, and I wish you good-bye. I do not think that there was the slightest reason why John should have again kissed her at parting, but he did so. She bore it, not struggling with him, but she took his caress with sullen endurance. It'll be the last, she said. Good-bye, John Eames. Good-bye, Amelia. Try to make him a good wife, and then you'll be happy. She turned up her nose at this, assuming a look of unutterable scorn. But she said nothing further, and then he left the room. At the parlour door he met Mrs. Roper, and had his parting words with her. "'I am so glad you came,' said she. "'It was just that word you said that made Miss Pruce stay. Her money is so ready, you know. And so you've had it all out with her about Cradell.' She'll make him a good wife, she will indeed, much better than you've been giving her credit for. I don't doubt she'll be a very good wife. You see, Mr. Eames, it's all over now, and we understand each other, don't we? It made me very unhappy when she was setting her cap at you, it did indeed. She is my own daughter, and I couldn't go against her, could I? But I knew it wasn't in any way suiting. Laws, I know the difference. She's good enough for him any day of the week, Mr. Eames. That she is, Saturdays or Sundays, said Johnny, not knowing exactly what he ought to say. So she is, and if he does his duty by her, she won't go astray in hers by him. And as for you, Mr. Eames, I am sure I've always felt it an honour and a pleasure to have you in the house, and if ever you could use a good word in sending to me any of your young men— I'd do by them as a mother should, I would indeed. I know I've been to blame about those lupexes, but haven't I suffered for it, Mr. Eames? And it was difficult to know at first, wasn't it? And as to you and Amelia, if you would send any of your young men to try, there couldn't be anything more of that kind, could there? I know it hasn't all been just as it should have been, that is, as regards you, but I should like to hear you say that you found me honest before you went. I have tried to be honest, I have indeed. Eames assured her that he was convinced of her honesty, and that he had never thought of impugning her character, either in regard to those unfortunate people, the Lupexes, or in reference to other matters. He did not think, he said, that any young men would consult him as to their lodgings, but if he could be of any service to her, he would. Then he bade her good-bye, and having bestowed half a sovereign on the faithful Jemima, he took a long farewell of Burton Crescent. Amelia had told him not to come and see her when she should be married, 
and he had resolved that he would take her at her word. So he walked off from the crescent, not exactly shaking the dust from his feet, but resolving that he would know no more either of its dust or of its dirt. Dirt enough he had encountered there certainly, and he was now old enough to feel that the inmates of Mrs. Roper's house had not been those among whom a resting place for his early years should judiciously have been sought. But he had come out of the fire comparatively unharmed, and I regret to say that he felt but little for the terrible scorchings to which his friend had been subjected, and was about to subject himself. He was quite content to look at the matter exactly as it was looked at by Mrs. Roper. Amelia was good enough for Joseph Crudell any day of the week. Poor Crudell, of whom in these pages after this notice no more will be heard, I cannot but think that a hard measure of justice was meted out to him in proportion to the extent of his sins, more weak and foolish than our friend and hero he had been but not, to my knowledge, more wicked. But it is to the vain and foolish that the punishments fall, and to them they fall so thickly and constantly that the thinker is driven to think that vanity and folly are of all sins those which may be the least forgiven. As for Crudell, I may declare that he did marry Amelia, that he did with some pride take the place of master of the house at the bottom of Mrs. Roper's table, and that he did make himself responsible for all Mrs. Roper's debts. Of his future fortunes there is not space to speak in these pages. Going away from the Crescent, Eames had himself driven to the office, which he reached just as the men were leaving it at four o'clock. Cradell was gone, so that he did not see him on that afternoon, but he had an opportunity of shaking hands with Mr. Love, who treated him with all the smiling courtesy due to an official bigwig, for a private secretary, if not absolutely a bigwig, is semi-big, and entitled to a certain amount of reverence. And he passed Mr. Kissing in the passage, hurrying along as usual with a huge book under his arm. Mr. Kissing, hurried as he was, stopped his shuffling feet, but Eames only looked at him, hardly honouring him with the acknowledgement of a nod of his head. Mr. Kissing, however, was not offended. He knew that the private secretary of the first commissioner had been the guest of an earl, and what more than a nod could be expected from him. After that, John made his way into the august presence of Sir Raffle, and found that great man putting on his shoes in the presence of Fitzhoward. Fitzhoward blushed, but the shoes had not been touched by him as he took occasion afterwards to inform John Eames. Sir Raffle was all smiles and civility. "'Delighted to see you back, Eames, am, upon my word, though I and Fitzhoward have got on capitally in your absence, haven't we, Fitzhoward?' "'Oh, yes,' drawled Fitzhoward. "'I haven't minded it for a time, just while Eames has been away.' "'You're much too idle to keep at it, I know, "'but your bread will be buttered for you elsewhere, "'so it doesn't signify my compliments to the Duchess when you see her.' "'Then Fitzhoward went. "'And how's my dear old friend?' asked Sir Raffle, "'as though of all men living Lord de Guest were the one "'for whom he had the strongest and the oldest love.' and yet he must have known that John Eames knew as much about it as he did himself. But there are men who have the most lively gratification in calling lords and marquises their friends, though they know that nobody believes a word of what they say, even though they know how great is the odium they incur, and how lasting is the ridicule which their vanity produces. It is a gentle insanity which prevails in the outer courts of every aristocracy, and as it brings with itself considerable annoyance and but a lukewarm pleasure, it should not be treated with too keen a severity. "'And how's my dear old friend?' Eames assured him that his dear old friend was all right, that Lady Julia was all right, that the dear old place was all right. 
the raffle now spoke as though the dear old place were quite well known to him was the game doing pretty well was there a promise of bad sir raffle's anxiety was quite intense and expressed with almost familiar affection and by the by where are you living at present well i'm not settled i'm at the great western railway hotel at this moment capital house very only it's expensive if you stay there the whole season johnny had no idea of remaining there beyond one night but he said nothing as to this by the by you might as well come and dine with us to-morrow lady buffle is most anxious to know you there'll be one or two with us i did ask my friend dumbelo but there's some nonsense going on in the house and he thinks that he can't get away johnny was more gracious than lord dumbelo and accepted the invitation i wonder what lady buffle will be like he said to himself as he walked away from the office he had turned into the great western hotel not as yet knowing where to look for a home and there we will leave him eating his solitary mutton-chop at one of those tables which are so comfortable to the eye but which are so comfortless in reality i speak not now with reference to the excellent establishment which has been named but to the nature of such tables in general a solitary mutton-chop in an hotel coffee-room is not a banquet to be envied by any god and if the mutton-chop be converted into soup fish little dishes big dishes and the rest the matter becomes worse and not better what comfort are you to have seated alone on that horsehair chair staring into the room and watching the waiters as they whisk about their towels no one but an englishman has ever yet thought of subjecting himself to such a position as that but here we will leave john eames and in doing so i must be allowed to declare that only now at this moment has he entered on his manhood hitherto he has been a hobbledehoy a calf as it were who had carried his calfishness later into life than is common with calves but who did not perhaps on that account give promise of making a worse ox than the rest of them his life hitherto as recorded in these pages had afforded him no brilliant success had hardly qualified him for the role of hero which he has been made to play i feel that i have been in fault in giving such prominence to a hobbledehoy and that i should have told my story better had i brought mr crosby more conspicuously forward on my canvas he at any rate has gotten to himself a wife as a hero always should do whereas i must leave my poor friend johnny without any matrimonial prospects it was thus that he thought of himself as he sat moping over his solitary table in the hotel coffee-room he acknowledged to himself that he had not hitherto been a man but at the same time he made some resolution which i trust may assist him in commencing his manhood from this date End of chapter 59, read by Nick Whitley, Purley, United Kingdom, 8th of December, 2023. Chapter 60 of The Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 60, Conclusion it was early in june that lily went up to her uncle at the great house pleading for hopkins pleading that to hopkins might be restored all the privileges of head gardener at the great house there was some absurdity in this seeing that he had never really relinquished his privileges but the manner of the quarrel had been in this wise there was in those days and had been for years a vexed question between hopkins and jolliffe the bailiff on the matter of stable manure hopkins had pretended to the right of taking what he required from the farmyard without asking leave of any one jolliffe in return had hinted that if this were so hopkins would take it all 
but i can't eat it hopkins had said jolliffe merely grunted signifying by the grunt as hopkins thought that though a gardener couldn't eat a mountain of manure fifty feet long and fifteen high couldn't eat in the body he might convert it into things edible for his own personal use and so there had been a great feud the unfortunate squire had of course been called on to arbitrate and having postponed his decision by every contrivance possible to him had at last been driven by jolliffe to declare that hopkins should take nothing that was not assigned to him hopkins when the decision was made known to him by his master bit his old lips and turned round upon his old heel speechless you'll find it so at all other places said the squire apologetically other places sneered hopkins where would he find other gardeners like himself it is hardly necessary to declare that from that moment he resolved that he would abide by no such order jolliffe on the next morning informed the squire that the order had been broken and the squire fretted and fumed wishing that jolliffe were well buried under the mountain in question if they all is to do as i like said jolliffe then nobody won't care for nobody the squire understood that an order if given must be obeyed and therefore with many inner groanings of the spirit resolved that war must be waged against hopkins on the following morning he found the old man himself wheeling a huge barrow of manure round from the yard into the kitchen garden now on ordinary occasions hopkins was not required to do with his own hands work of that description he had a man under him who hewed wood and carried water and wheeled barrows one man always and often too the squire knew when he saw him that he was sinning and bade him stop upon his road hopkins he said why didn't you ask for what you wanted before you took it the old man put down the barrow on the ground looked up in his master's face spat into his hands and then again resumed his barrow hopkins that won't do said the squire stop where you are what won't do said hopkins still holding the barrow from the ground but not as yet progressing put it down hopkins and hopkins did put it down don't you know that you are flatly disobeying my orders squire i've been here about this place going on nigh seventy years if you've been going on a hundred and seventy it wouldn't do that there should be more than one master i'm the master here and i intend to be so to the end take that manure back into the yard back into the yard said hopkins very slowly yes back into the yard why afore all their faces yes you've disobeyed me before all their faces hopkins paused a moment looking away from the squire and shaking his head as though he had need of deep thought but by the aid of deep thought had come at last to a right conclusion then he resumed the barrow and putting himself almost into a trot carried away his prize into the kitchen garden at the pace which he went it would have been beyond the squire's power to stop him nor would mr dale have wished to come to a personal encounter with his servant but he called after the man in dire wrath that if he were not obeyed the disobedient servant should rue the consequences for ever hopkins equal to the occasion shook his head as he trotted on deposited his load at the foot of the cucumber frames and then at once returning to his master tendered to him the key of the greenhouse master said hopkins speaking as best he could with his scanty breath 
there it is there's the key of course i don't want no warning and doesn't care about my week's wages i'll be out of the cottage afore night and as for the workers i suppose they'll let me in at once if your honour'll give em a line now as hopkins was well known by the squire to be the owner of three or four hundred pounds the hint about the workhouse must be allowed to have been melodramatic don't be a fool said the squire almost gnashing his teeth i know i've been a fool said hopkins about that ere doom my feelings has been too much for me when a man's feelings has been too much for him he'd better just take hisself off and lie in the workers till he dies and then he again tendered the key but the squire did not take the key and so hopkins went on i s'pose i'd better just see to the lights and the like of that till you've suited yourself mr dale it ud be a pity all them grapes should go off and they as you may say all one as fit for the table it's a long way the best crop i ever seen on em i've been that careful with em that i haven't had a natural night's rest not since february there ain't nobody about this place as understands grapes nor yet anywhere nigh that could be got at my lord's head man is wary ignorant but even if he knew ever so of course he couldn't come here i suppose i'd better keep the key till you're suited mr dale then for a fortnight there was an interregnum in the gardens terrible in the annals of allington hopkins lived in his cottage indeed and looked most sedulously after the grapes in looking after the grapes too he took the greenhouses under his care but he would have nothing to do with the outer gardens took no wages returning the amount sent to him back to the squire and insisted with everybody that he had been dismissed he went about with some terrible horticultural implement always in his hand with which it was said that he intended to attack jolliffe but jolliffe prudently kept out of his way as soon as it had been resolved by mrs dale and lily that the flitting from the small house at allington was not to be accomplished lily communicated the fact to hopkins miss said he when i said them few words to you and your mamma i knew that you would lessen to reason this was no more than lily had expected that hopkins should claim the honour of having prevailed by his arguments was a matter of course yes said lily we've made up our minds to stay uncle wishes it wishes it laws miss it ain't only wishes and we all wishes it why now look at the reason of the thing here's this here house but hopkins it's decided we're going to stay what i want to know is this can you come at once and help me to unpack why well, this very evening as is yes now we want to have the things about again before they come back from guestwick hopkins scratched his head and hesitated not wishing to yield to any proposition that could be considered as childish but he gave way at last feeling that the work itself was good work mrs dale also assented laughing at lily for her folly as she did so and in this way the things were unpacked very quickly and the alliance between lily and hopkins became for the time very close this work of unpacking and resettling was not yet over when the battle of the manure broke out and therefore it was that hopkins when his feelings had become altogether too much for him about the doom came at last to lily and laying down at her feet all the weight and all the glory of his sixty-odd years of life implored her to make matters straight for him it's been a killing me miss so it has to see the way they've been a 
cutting that asparagus. It ain't cutting at all. It's just hocking it up, what is fit and what isn't altogether. And they've been a-putting the plants in where I didn't mean em, though they knowed I didn't mean em. I stood by, miss, and said never a word. I'd a died sooner. But, Miss Lily, what my sufferings have been, cause of my feelings getting the better of me about that, you know, miss, nobody will ever tell. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Then Hopkins turned away and wept. Uncle, said Lily, creeping close up against his chair, I want to ask you a great favour. A great favour? Well, I don't think I shall refuse you anything at present. It isn't to ask another earl to the house, is it? Another earl? said Lily. Yes, haven't you heard? Miss Bell has been here this morning insisting that I should have over Lord de Guest and his sister for the marriage. It seems that there was some scheming between Bell and Lady Julia. Of course you'll ask them. Yeah, of course I must. I've no way out of it. It'll be all very well for Bell, who'll be off to Wales with her lover. But what am I to do with the Earl and Lady Julia when they're gone? Will you come and help me? In answer to this, Lily, of course, promised that she would come and help. Indeed, said she, I thought we were all asked up for the day. And now for my favour, uncle. You must forgive poor Hopkins. Forgive a fiddlestick, said the squire. No, but you must. You can't think how unhappy he is. How can I forgive a man who won't forgive me? He goes prowling about the place doing nothing, and he sends me back his wages, and he looks as though he were going to murder someone, and all because he wouldn't do as he was told. How am I to forgive such a man as that? But, uncle, why not? It would be his forgiving me. He knows very well that he may come back whenever he pleases, and, indeed, for the matter of that, he has never gone away. But he is so very unhappy. What can I do to make him happier? Just go down to his cottage and tell him that you forgive him. Then he'll argue with me. No, I don't think he will. He is too much down in the world for arguing now. Ah, you don't know him as I do. All the misfortunes in the world wouldn't stop that man's conceit. Of course I'll go, if you ask me. But it seems to me that I'm made to knock under to everybody. I hear a great deal about other people's feelings, but I don't know that mine are very much thought of. He was not altogether in a happy mood, and Lily almost regretted that she had persevered, but she did succeed in carrying him off across the garden to the cottage, and as they went together she promised him that she would think of him always, always. The scene with Hopkins cannot be described now, as it would take too many of our few remaining pages— it resulted, I am afraid I must confess, in nothing more triumphant to the squire than a treaty of mutual forgiveness. Hopkins acknowledged with much self-reproach that his feelings had been too many for him. But then, look at his provocation! He could not keep his tongue from that matter, and certainly said as much in his own defence as he did in confession of his sins. The substantial triumph was altogether his, for nobody again ever dared to interfere with his operations in the farmyard. He showed his submission to his master, mainly by consenting to receive his wages for the two weeks which he had passed in idleness. Owing to this little accident, Lily was not so much oppressed by Hopkins as she had expected to be in that matter of their altered plans. But this salvation did not extend to Mrs. Hearn, to Mrs. Crump, or, above all, to Mrs. Boyce. They, all of them, took an interest more or less strong in the Hopkins controversy, 
but their interest in the occupation of the small house was much stronger and it was found useless to put mrs hearn off with the gardener's persistent refusal of his wages when she was big with inquiry whether the house was to be painted inside as well as out ah said she i think i'll go and look at lodgings at guestwick myself and pack up some of my beds lily made no answer to this feeling that it was a part of that punishment which she had expected dear dear said mrs crump to the two girls well to be sure we should have been lone without he and mayhap we might have got worse in your place but why did he go and fasten up all your things in them big boxes just to unfasten em all again we changed our minds mrs crump said bell with some severity yes i know ye you changed your mindses well it's all right for likes o ye no doubt but if we changes our mindses we hears of it so it seems to we said lily but never mind mrs crump do you send us our letters up early and then we won't quarrel oh letters drat them for letters i wish there weren't no sich things there was a man here yesterday with his imperence i don't know where he come from down from lunnon i believe and this was wrong and that was wrong and everything was wrong and then he said he'd have me discharge the service dear me mrs crump that wouldn't do at all discharged the service tum's farden a day so i told him to discharge hisself and take all the old bundles and things away upon his shoulders letters indeed what business have they with post missus if they can't pay em better nor tum's farden a day and in this way under the shelter of mrs crump's storm of wrath against the inspector who had visited her lily and bell escaped much that would have fallen upon their own heads but mrs boyce still remained i may here add in order that mrs crump's history may be carried on to the farthest possible point that she was not discharged the service and that she still receives her tuppence farthing a day from the crown that's a bitter old lady said the inspector to the man who was driving him yes sir they all says the same about she there ain't none of em get much change out of mrs crump bell and lily went together also to mrs boyce's if she makes herself very disagreeable i shall insist upon talking of your marriage said lily i've not the slightest objection said bell only i don't know what there can be to say about it marrying the doctor is such a very commonplace sort of thing not a bit more commonplace than marrying the parson said lily oh yes it is parsons marriages are often very grand affairs they come in among county people that's their luck in life doctors never do nor lawyers i don't think lawyers ever get married in the country they're supposed to do it up in london but a country doctor's wedding is not a thing to be talked about much mrs boyce probably agreed in this view of the matter seeing that she did not choose the coming marriage as her first subject of conversation as soon as the two girls were seated she flew away immediately to the house and began to express her very great surprise her surprise and her joy also at the sudden change which had been made in their plans it is so much nicer you know said she that things should be pleasant among relatives things always have been tolerably pleasant with us said bell oh yes i'm sure of that i've always said it was quite a pleasure to see you and your uncle together and when we heard about your all having to leave but we didn't have to leave mrs boyce we were going to leave because we thought mamma would be more comfortable in guestwick and now we're not going to leave because we've all changed our mindses as mrs crump calls it and is it true the house is going to be painted asked mrs boyce i believe it is true said lily inside and out it must be done some day said bell yes to be sure but i must say it is generous of the squire there's such a 
deal of woodwork about your house i know i wish the ecclesiastical commissioners would paint ours but nobody ever does anything for the clergy i'm sure i'm delighted you're going to stay as i said to mr boyce what should we ever have done without you i believe the squire had made up his mind that he would not let the place i don't think he ever has let it and if there was nobody in it it would all go to rack and ruin wouldn't it had your mamma to pay anything for the lodgings she engaged at guestwick upon my word i don't know bell can tell you better about that than i as dr crofts settled it i suppose dr crofts tells her everything and so the conversation was changed and mrs boyce was made to understand that whatever further mystery there might be it would not be unravelled on that occasion it was settled that dr crofts and bell should be married about the middle of june and the squire determined to give what grace he could to the ceremony by opening his own house on the occasion lord de guest and lady julia were invited by special arrangement between her ladyship and bell as has been before explained the colonel also with lady fanny came up from torquay on the occasion this being the first visit made by the colonel to his paternal roof for many years bernard did not accompany his father he had not yet gone abroad but there were circumstances which made him feel that he would not find himself comfortable at the wedding the service was performed by mr boyce assisted as the county chronicle very fully remarked by the reverend john joseph jones m a late of jesus college cambridge and curate of st peter's northgate guestwick the fault of which little advertisement was this that as none of the readers of the paper had patience to get beyond the reverend john joseph jones the fact of bell's marriage with dr crofts was not disseminated as widely as might have been wished the marriage went off very nicely the squire was upon his very best behaviour and welcomed his guests as though he really enjoyed their presence there in his halls hopkins who was quite aware that he had been triumphant decorated the old rooms with mingled flowers and greenery with an assiduous care which pleased the two girls mightily and during this work of wreathing and decking there was one little morsel of feeling displayed which may as well be told in these last lines lily had been encouraging the old man while bell for a moment had been absent i wish it had been for thee my darling he said i wish it had been for thee it is much better as it is hopkins she answered solemnly not with him though he went on not with him i wouldn't a hung a bow for him but with t'other one lily said no word further she knew that the man was expressing the wishes of all around her she said no word further and then bell returned to them but no one at the wedding was so gay as lily so gay so bright and so wedding-like she flirted with the old earl till he declared that he would marry her himself no one seeing her that evening and knowing nothing of her immediate history would have imagined that she herself had been cruelly jilted some six or eight months ago and those who did know her could not imagine that what she then suffered had hit her so hard that no recovery seemed possible for her but though no recovery as she herself believed was possible for her though she was as a man whose right arm had been taken from him in the battle still all the world had not gone with that right arm the bullet which had maimed her sorely had not touched her life and she scorned to go about the world complaining either by word or look of the injury she had received wives when they have lost their husbands still eat and laugh she said to herself and he is not dead like that so she resolved that she would be happy and i here declare that she not only seemed to carry out her resolution 
but that she did carry it out in very truth you're a dear good man and i know you'll be good to her she said to crofts just as he was about to start with his bride i'll try at any rate he answered and i shall expect you to be good to me too remember you have married the whole family and sir you mustn't believe a word of what that bad man says in his novels about mothers-in-law he has done a great deal of harm and shut half the ladies in england out of their daughters houses he shan't shut mrs dale out of mine remember he doesn't now good-bye so the bride and bridegroom went off and lily was left to flirt with lord de guest of whom else is it necessary that a word or two should be said before i allow the weary pen to fall from my hand the squire after much inward struggling on the subject had acknowledged to himself that his sister-in-law had not received from him that kindness which she had deserved he had acknowledged this purporting to do his best to amend his past errors and i think i may say that his efforts in that line would not be received ungraciously by mrs dale i am inclined therefore to think that life at allington both at the great house and at the small would soon become pleasanter than it used to be in former days lily soon got the balmoral boots or at least soon learned that the power of getting them as she pleased had devolved upon her from her uncle's gift so that she talked even of buying the squirrel's cage but i am not aware that her extravagance led her as far as that lord de courcy we left suffering dreadfully from gout and ill-temper at courcy castle yes indeed to him in his latter days life did not seem to offer much that was comfortable his wife had now gone from him and declared positively to her son-in-law that no earthly consideration should ever induce her to go back again not if i were to starve she said by which she intended to signify that she would be firm in her resolve even though she should thereby lose her carriage and horses poor mr gazebee went down to courcy and had a dreadful interview with the earl but matters were at last arranged and her ladyship remained at baden-baden in a state of semi-starvation that is to say she had but one horse to her carriage as regards crosby i am inclined to believe that he did again recover his power at his office he was mr butterwell's master and the master also of mr optimist and the major he knew his business and could do it which was more perhaps than might fairly be said of any of the other three under such circumstances he was sure to get in his hand and lead again but elsewhere his star did not recover its ascendancy he dined at his club almost daily and there were those with whom he habitually formed some little circle but he was not the crosby of former days the crosby known in belgravia and in st james's street he had taken his little vessel bravely out into the deep waters and had sailed her well while fortune stuck close to him but he had forgotten his nautical rules and success had made him idle his plummet and lead had not been used and he had kept no lookout ahead therefore the first rock he met shivered his bark to pieces his wife the lady alexandrina is to be seen in the one-horse carriage with her mother at Baden-Baden. End of chapter 60 Read by Nick Whitley, Purley, United Kingdom, 10th of December 2023 End of The Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope